Sitting in a cozy local bar, I slowly finished my third mug of beer. I was trying to forget the recent troubles that had befallen me, but the whirlwind of thoughts kept me restless. Around me there was a gentle hum of conversation and soft music playing, but I barely noticed, lost in my thoughts. Suddenly, someone's hand touched my shoulder, pulling me out of my reverie. Turning around, I saw a man in his 40s standing next to me named Bill. He was a local hunter with not the best reputation. Once, after a hefty dose of drinking, he got into a fight with some friends and beat up a few guys. Among them was the son of an influential person in town, which caused a big scandal. The police intervened, but the situation was somehow resolved in the end. How's it going, Mike? He asked, smiling. Looks like you've had a tough week. Well, something like that, I mumbled. Apparently he already knew about my problem. I'll have a dark beer and get him another one I'm treating, he said to the bartender. I wanted to refuse, but I didn't say anything. I didn't have the strength or desire to interact with anyone right now. I just raised the beer mug and emptied it. Soon the bartender brought me a new one, and Bill continued, Women, they're something else, aren't they? Not all, of course, but you've run into the one you'd better not mess with. He saw my angry look and added, Easy, easy, rumors about your affairs have been circulating in town for a long time. I heard she ripped you off for a large sum. Tough luck, buddy. I didn't reply, just kept staring into my mug. Yes, I had problems, but I didn't want to share them. I was already thinking of leaving, but Bill said something that made me stay and look at him with interest. You know, we've known each other for a long time, and I know you're a good guy. I have an offer for you. Would you like to make some quick cash? He said, lowering his voice towards the end. Is it related to drugs? I asked, skeptical. Drugs? No way. Let me tell you something, and I hope this stays between us, he said, to which I nodded affirmatively. So one guy approached me. He's interested in prehistoric animal bones, mammoth tusks to be precise. I don't know what he wants them for. Maybe he sells them to the Chinese as medicine or just hangs them on the wall. That's not the point. The main thing is how much he's offering for them. He glanced around and leaning closer, whispered, He's offering 50 grand for one tusk, can you imagine? Find 20 tusks, and you've got a million in your pocket, not bad, huh? I pondered. It was good money. I had debts of 200,000, and if I joined Bill, I could pay them off quickly. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. There must be some catch. I asked him about it. He looked around, seeing that no one was eavesdropping, whispered quietly. Yes, the thing is, it's illegal. The place where we want to dig for bones belongs to the federal government, and excavations there are prohibited. But on the other hand, those places are very wild and hardly anyone ever goes there, so the risk is very low, but it's there. We have to be prepared for it, but if we take the risk and it pays off, we'll make a good amount of cash. Bill looked at me with a questioning look, waiting for my answer. I remained silent. Honestly, anyone who knows me well would say that I'm not the risk-taking type. I always preferred to act thoughtfully. Some would call it indecisiveness, but at least my life was always calm. No risks, no problems. The only time in my life when I did something thoughtlessly was when I got involved with her, and it didn't lead to anything good. So I needed to think. I told Bill that I would call him tomorrow and give him an answer. He nodded understandingly and said there was no rush. I thanked him for the beer, then paid and left the bar returning home. Standing on the porch, rummaging through my pockets for keys, I noticed a letter sticking out of the mailbox in the door. 
Opening the door, I pulled it out. It was a notification from the bank. It said that I had to make the first installment of $10,000. There was a week left until it was due. I stared at the envelope for a long time, then sighed tiredly, stepped out onto the road, and looked at the house. It was left to me by my deceased parents, and all the warm memories were associated with it. I couldn't lose it, no need to think about it. I took out my phone and dialed Bill's number, a quiet ring and, hey, I'm in, I said. Oh, I see you didn't take long to think. Good, we're planning to head out tomorrow, but today we need to buy some stuff, so I'll pick you up in the morning, around 10, so be ready. Got it, I replied and hung up. The next day, around 10 in the morning, I heard a car horn. Peeking out the window, I saw it was Bill in his old pickup truck. I put on a cap, locked the house, and got into his car. We headed to the city center where various shops were located. We arrived quickly and stopped in front of a household goods store proudly named Homestead Hearth. It belonged to my acquaintance, whom everyone called Strange Fred. I don't know where this nickname came from, in my opinion. He was the most ordinary person. We entered the store. There was no one inside. I looked around. The shelves and racks were neatly arranged, offering customers a wide range of goods from kitchen utensils to decorative interior elements. First, we went to the hunting and fishing section, where I bought a waterproof jumpsuit and rubber boots. We also got a hat with a mosquito net there. Then we headed to the section where household appliances were sold and approached the place where huge water pumps were standing for water pumping. Soon, Fred came up to us. Hey, buddy, Bill greeted him. Give us some advice, something suitable. I need a device that would effectively pump out water but also allow me to irrigate with a strong jet. The shopkeeper paused, then began to explain the intricacies of each model. As we stood listening, suddenly the bell on the entrance door chimed. We turned to see a man in his fifties entering the premises dressed in a green shirt and dark green trousers, topped with a hat. He was the local park ranger. I didn't know him, but I noticed Bill seemed slightly nervous. Soon he approached us. Hey Bill, Fred, how are you? He greeted us, nodding and tipping his hat. Not bad, Fred replied. What brings you here? I need to purchase a couple of flashlights for my colleagues, he said, noticing our selections and giving us a thorough look. Then he asked, Bill, we haven't seen you around much lately in the woods. What's up? Been busy, boss, Bill replied, trying to appear casual. Some work came up, so I didn't have time for hunting. I see. And what are you guys picking? Basement flooded, the ranger asked. No, flooded my cousin's ranch. He asked for help, Bill replied. I see. Well, I won't keep you then, he said, and headed towards other shelves. We watched him as he left the store. Bill chose two devices, paid, and we loaded them into the pickup. It was evident he wanted to leave quickly. As we got into the car, he said, that was Clayton Barrett, the local head of the Environmental Protection Department. A meticulous guy can nitpick about anything. And I have a feeling he's on to something. We need to be careful with him. After his words, I glanced at the store, seeing the ranger leaving the one Bill was talking about. Bill started the pickup and we set off. I looked back and saw the park ranger watching us as we drove away. The next day, Bill picked me up around 4 a.m. It was still dark, the streets empty and quiet. Suppressing yawns, feeling the sleep still clinging to me, I got into the car. We silently navigated through the city street shrouded in early morning darkness, soon leaving them behind. As we drove, the surroundings gradually came to life with the first signs of dawn. Darkness gave way to silvery rays modestly piercing through the horizon. In the distance, nature began to awaken, filling the air with sounds and movement. 
wild animals probably started their morning rituals too. The air was fresh and cool, carrying the scent of morning dew and earth, instantly sharpening awareness. Alaska in the summer was astonishing. With each passing kilometer, I was increasingly impressed by the beauty of the surrounding nature. Endless forests, mist-covered mountains, and crystal-clear rivers. But soon, our smooth ride on the concrete road changed as we turned onto a rugged trail leading into the wilderness. The road here left much to be desired. Potholes, rocks, and tree roots created a true off-road experience. I was being tossed from side to side. Bill skillfully maneuvered between obstacles, seemingly familiar with every twist of this road. Soon, all signs of the road disappeared, and we followed a faint trail, presumably left by someone who had traveled before us. I asked Bill who else would be in the team. He said they were already there and I would meet them soon. I nodded and we continued our silent journey. After about two hours, we were driving along a small stream when I saw the outlines of a gray pickup truck in the distance. Next to it were several tents and people were moving around them. Soon we stopped beside them and got out of the car. Four people approached us. Their clothing was adapted to the local conditions. Tall boots, insulated jackets despite the summer season, and headgear to protect against insect bites and sun rays. They eyed us curiously. Then Bill stepped forward and said, Hey guys, meet another helper I brought along. This is Mike, my old friend. He works as a mechanic at Alex's workshop. I nodded in greeting, and Bill began to introduce me to his friends. He pointed to the first one. He was a tall, lanky man around 35 with a bowl-cut hairstyle. His name was George. Then there were two guys in their 30s who were twins with blonde hair and blue eyes. They were Max and Alex. They smiled warmly at me and I felt they were good guys. The last one was slim, of short stature with a daring look. I knew him. We went to the same school. Not a pleasant guy, his name was Kevin. When our eyes met, he smirked cunningly but didn't say anything. Having introduced ourselves, we started unloading the pickup, pulling out pumps, tents, and fuel. Taking my tent, I set it up next to the others and placed my belongings inside. Then I joined the rest. They were already discussing the approximate location for the excavations led by George. He had been doing reconnaissance work these past few days, and according to him, he found a small rise not far from the river. That's where we would start. I surveyed the surroundings. Along the stream where we stood, a couple of trees grew. Mostly it was open space, which was advantageous for us, because digging near trees would be very difficult due to the roots. By the way, about digging in Alaska... At this latitude, permafrost prevails, so you can't dig with a regular shovel here. That's why we needed pumps. We discussed the plans and divided into two teams. With me were George and Kevin. I went and changed into a waterproof suit, put on boots, and donned a hat with a mesh. It was impossible to work without it here, as a cloud of mosquitoes flew around which managed to get into my eyes, mouth, and nose in the short time we were here. After we were ready, we lifted the pumps and took small shovels. Then we set off. We walked about 200 or 300 feet along the river when we saw a large rise not far from the shore. We set up the pumps near the river with one end of the pipe inserted into the water and the other longer end stretched towards the rise. The second team did the same, but from the other side, it turned out we would be washing the soil from both edges. Once everything was set up, George turned on the pump. It ran on diesel, and the sound of the engine echoed throughout the area. I held the hose and directed it towards the ground. A huge and strong stream of water hit the ground and slowly began to wash it away. It was a long and exhausting process. The stream poured out of the hose, water spreading over the ground. 
but soon a small creek formed, flowing back into the river. While I held the hose and directed the stream, George and Kevin worked with shovels, clearing away the washed out soil. We continued digging until two in the afternoon when Bill announced it was time for lunch. I looked at our progress. We had indeed done a good job. Most of the soil had been washed away, but I was very tired. It was truly heavy work. After turning off the pumps, we walked back to the tents where we lit a fire and warmed up some food. Sitting around it on folding chairs, we began to eat. After eating, the guys started talking about how they would spend the money. Soon it was my turn. Kevin sarcastically asked, I heard you got into big debts because of a skirt. I glared at him angrily and didn't reply. Bill nudged him to shut up. George and the twins looked at me with curiosity, but I wasn't going to tell them anything. I got up and headed to my tent. As I lay there, memories of the past month came flooding back to me. I remembered how it all started. I met her when she brought her car to our service center for repairs. She was stunningly beautiful, and I fell for her at first sight. I had never taken risks or approached such women, but here I did, and to my surprise, she responded positively. Things escalated quickly, and soon we started dating. Surprisingly, everyone around me told me she was using me, but I didn't believe them. I was so happy. A month passed, and she suggested we start a business. Showing me a plan, she said she needed money, and offered me to join her venture. Of course, like an idiot, I agreed, mortgaging my house and giving away all my savings. I waited for her to return, but she disappeared. I searched for her everywhere, but couldn't find her, and then I realized I had been deceived. I reported it to the police, but they couldn't find her either. Of course, the news spread throughout the city. This incident left a deep mark on my soul. I struggled with it for a long time, but then I accepted it and decided to move on. Eventually here, I lay in a tent, preparing to engage in illegal fishing. About half an hour later, I heard Bill calling. After changing, I immediately returned to work. We diligently dug all day, but to our disappointment, we didn't find anything valuable. A gloomy mood hung in the air. The next morning we got up even earlier and continued working with unabated diligence, but the result remained the same. Eventually it was decided to relocate to another location in search of luck. On the third day early in the morning we packed up the tents and set off downstream. After covering two miles we found a spot that seemed very promising. We set up camp and after changing immediately got to work. Water and mud flowing on the ground along with a swarm of mosquitoes were our companions, but nobody complained. Lunchtime was approaching when we heard Kevin's loud cry. We ran to him and saw him pointing at something white sticking out of the ground. Jackpot! yelled Bill. After that, we brought the hose and began carefully washing the soil around the bone with a stream of water, and soon we managed to pull it out. It was a huge mammoth tusk about 10 feet long. Its sharp edge was broken. It was huge and heavy. Happy and satisfied smiles were on the faces of the guys. I myself rejoiced like a child receiving a Christmas present. We set aside the tusk and enthusiastically continued excavating where one had been found, another was expected. The day was coming to an end and we stood in a clearing by the river and looked down. There on the grass lay four huge tusks. Wide smiles adorned our faces. And why not? In three days we earned 200,000. In the many years I spent working as a mechanic, I had never been able to earn money so quickly. In the morning, we loaded the tusks into the pickup and covered them with a tarp. Now we needed to transport them without getting caught. I decided to go with Bill, while the guys stayed behind to search for a new location. We followed the same path we had come, 
but moved slower and more carefully to avoid damaging the cargo. When we reached the concrete road, we sped up but tried not to break any rules to avoid attracting police attention. Soon, we entered the town and stopped at a traffic light. Suddenly, another car pulled up next to us. I turned my head and saw Clayton Barrett behind the wheel of his SUV. He was turning his head trying to see what we had in the trunk. I glanced at Bill, who whispered without moving his lips. Don't panic. Just pretend you didn't see him, relax, and look straight ahead. I followed his advice, but I couldn't help but feel nervous. We were driving with cargo, and the one who could arrest us for it happened to pass by. It's how lucky you have to be to get caught like this. Soon the traffic light turned green, and we moved forward. I looked in the side mirror and saw the ranger turn right. I breathed a sigh of relief. Bill smiled and said, how's the adrenaline rush? I just smiled a little in response. Soon our path led us to our destination, a vast area where huge warehouses were neatly arranged. We carefully turned into one of the passages between the rows and headed towards one of the impressive hangars. Bill honked briefly, and as if on command, the gates slowly began to open. We drove inside, where a man in a blue work jumpsuit was waiting for us. He was about 30 years old, and he looked like a thug. At least that's what I thought. After we stopped the car and got out, Bill approached the man and greeted him. Then they engaged in conversation. I stood aside, unable to hear their conversation. Soon they headed to the tarp, and opening it, they started pulling out the tusks. I joined them, and after unloading, we took turns putting the tusks on the scale while the man recorded the weight in his notebook. After weighing all the tusks, the man pulled out a calculator and started counting. Bill stood nearby, checking the calculations. After that, the stranger opened the pouch on his belt, took out a stack of dollars, counted them, and handed it to Bill. After that, Bill and the stranger shook hands as a sign of the deal's completion. We got back into the pickup and slowly driving away from the hangar, we left the area. As we drove, Bill said, good deal, we made $195,000. Not bad, I replied. We decided to celebrate and had lunch at an expensive restaurant in the city center. After that, Bill headed to the store to buy tools for work and fuel for the pumps. I, on the other hand, taking my share from him, went to the bank and paid off part of my debt. Then I went home. Bill picked me up closer to 2 p.m., and we headed back into the woods. When we returned to the camp, there was nobody there. Only cars and tents stood. Where did the guys disappear to? Perhaps they found a new spot. We had two hours until dark, so we decided to look for them. Moving along the river, we heard the sound of pumps in the distance. Soon we found them working near a large burial mound. It was already considerably excavated, and upon closer inspection I noticed a couple of tusks sticking out of the ground. Bill noticed it too and eagerly ran up to them. Incredible! How did you guys find this place? He asked in amazement. It's George. He discovered it this morning during reconnaissance. One of the twins said joyfully. As I passed by this place, George continued, I suddenly felt some kind of call. I looked around but found nothing except for this mound. So I decided to check it out. I called the guys and we started digging here. And that's when we uncovered these tusks. But the strangest thing, look. He pointed to the tusks. And we approached to examine them in detail. See, they're embedded in the ground and there's no mammoth skeleton here. As if someone deliberately placed them here. We looked at them, speculating on what it could be. Various hypotheses were put forward, but Bill interrupted the debate and said that it was getting dark and it was time to return to camp. The next morning, inspired, we set out to continue yesterday's work. 
With six of us, the work progressed faster, and by lunchtime, we had exposed the edges of the mound. To our shock, we counted 24 tusks buried in a circle at equal distances with their curved sides facing inward. It resembled some kind of ritual circle. Bill walked around the circle with a happy smile, saying, This is worth more than a million. The others were also delighted with the find. Compared to last time, this was a real jackpot. I wanted to be happy too. But for some reason, I had a bad feeling. As we were excavating, I felt a pressure on my chest. I don't know if it was because of the weather or simply fatigue, but something weighed heavily on me. We pulled these tusks out of the ground and brought them to camp. Then we held a meeting. The thing was, we had only dug up the edges of the mound. It was still largely intact. The question was whether to continue digging. Kevin spoke up and I looked into his eyes, noticing a greedy glint. It's only three o'clock. Why don't we continue excavating? Who knows what else we might find? Everyone pondered. Ideally, we needed to transport the tusks we had found as soon as possible, as there was a threat that local rangers might show up. But this was the wilderness, and it was unlikely that anyone would stumble upon it. Personally, I was against it, but the others agreed, so there was nowhere to go. The sound of a diesel engine echoed through the area, and we resumed digging. The work was in full swing. Chunks of earth broke off, fell, and washed into the river. Evening approached, and aiming the stream of water, I dislodged a large chunk of earth when I noticed a skull protruding from the surface. I lowered the hose in alarm and called the others over. Then I continued to blast water while Bill helped dig with a shovel. Soon, a skeleton appeared before us. Surprisingly, it hadn't disintegrated into pieces, but remained intact like a monolith. The skeleton was seated in a lotus position, as if meditating before death. When we washed away the remaining dirt, we could examine it better. At this point, George couldn't hold back and cursed while the other guys just stared in astonishment. I, too, was in shock, trying to quell the trembling. The thing was, while the skeleton resembled a human instead of a typical skull, it had an elongated muzzle, like an animal, with a row of sharp teeth covering the jaw. It had six fingers on its hands, folded in a prayer-like pose, and instead of feet, there were paws. What on earth was this? We examined the skeleton from all angles, trying to understand what kind of creature it was. At first, everyone was scared, but over time, we tried to figure it out. Was it a hoax or what? Bill suggested that someone in ancient times might have assembled this skeleton from different parts of humans and animals. It sounded reasonable, and we agreed with it. Leaving the skeleton behind, we returned to camp. It was getting dark, and we lit a fire. After dinner, we enthusiastically discussed ideas on how to spend the money we would earn. We had already forgotten about the last discovery. After an hour of chatting, we dispersed to our tents, and silence enveloped the camp. Only the chirping of insects and the nocturnal song of birds could be heard. I woke up in the middle of the night. It felt like someone was lurking around my tent. At first I thought it might be one of the guys, so I peeked outside but found no one. Then I decided to go relieve myself. Usually we did this behind the camp where bushes grew. I stood next to them and heard rustling nearby. I glanced around fearfully but saw no one. Then the rustling was in front of me. I squinted and saw a dark silhouette. Who could it be? I yelled, but no one responded. So I returned to camp and checked each tent. To my horror, everyone was in their place. Then who was it? I looked around again and noticed silhouettes in the darkness. It seemed like they were watching me and observing my actions. A strong shiver ran down my spine and my heart pounded harder. 
I walked to Bill's tent, opened it, and woke him up. He sleepily rubbed his eyes and asked what was going on. I told him something weird was happening outside. He got up and went outside. Then I pointed in the direction where I thought the shadows were. But he saw nothing. Neither did I. Everything fell silent, and the silhouettes vanished. Bill cursed at me for waking him up and returned to his tent. Meanwhile, I looked around in astonishment, trying to understand what had happened. Maybe I was imagining things. I returned to my tent and lay down, but couldn't fall asleep. After a while, I heard rustling again. I peeked outside, but once again, no one was there. There was nothing else to do, so I locked the entrance and waited for dawn. In the morning, everyone woke up lively and energetic, except for me. I couldn't sleep. At breakfast, Bill asked me about last night, and I told him what happened. Everyone looked at me skeptically and confirmed they hadn't heard anything. Kevin sarcastically remarked, He's always been a scaredy cat. I wanted to reply, but Bill told us to calm down. We spent the rest of the time in silence. After the meal, we discussed our next steps. Bill and another guy were supposed to start transporting the tusks. There were so many that it would require multiple trips. The rest were to continue excavating the mound. This time, Kevin volunteered to go. We loaded the tusks onto the pickup truck, managing to load a third of them at once. After the pickup left, we changed clothes and headed to the excavation site. Work progressed quickly, but I didn't feel well. I kept glancing at the skeleton, feeling uneasy. I didn't understand why the others were so calm. Maybe I was just too sensitive. We continued digging around in a circle, narrowing the diameter of the mound. Soon we discovered four more skeletons, identical to the first one. The findings were forming a pattern. It seemed that initially there was an outer circle of 24 mammoth tusks, and inside, skeletons were positioned equidistantly along the circumference, all facing towards the center of the mound. When I shared my conclusion with the guys, they were all interested to see what would be in the center of the circle. So, everyone started working even harder. Bill returned three hours after leaving, and we loaded the second batch of tusks onto the pickup truck. We told him about the discoveries, to which he nodded and said we should keep going. Sometime after lunch, we had dug up almost the entire mound. Stepping through mud and water, I blasted the water jet at chunks of earth which broke off with a squelch when suddenly something gray appeared. This time, it wasn't a skeleton but a mummy. We sprayed water on it, washing away the dirt, and soon the features of this creature became more pronounced. It was truly terrifying and ghastly, covered in fur. Its body seemed anthropomorphic, with a wolf-like head lying in a fetal position, wrapped in a silver chain that surprisingly hadn't lost its shine. When we fully uncovered it, it appeared to lie on a huge stone pedestal engraved with mysterious symbols, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Its eyes were closed, and it seemed completely dried out, we examined the creature with fear, trying to guess whether it had been alive or just an artificial dummy. When we finished digging, Bill and Kevin arrived and they too began examining this discovery. Discussions began about what to do with all these skeletons. I suggested it would be good to inform scientists and historians about them, as these skeletons could have archaeological value. But the guys were against it saying we could get arrested and sued, and it was better to leave everything as it was. Kevin, however, liked the chain wrapped around the mummy. He tried to tear it, but to no avail. I wanted to tell him not to touch it, but I stayed silent. Leaving the mound behind, we headed to load the remaining tusks. This time, I volunteered to go with Bill. As we drove away, the guys started a campfire for a snack. I cast one last glance at them and we disappeared into the trees. This trip was no different from the previous one. 
We reached the warehouse and the same man greeted us. After receiving the money, we went to Bill's house where he left all the cash. Then we went together to snack bar and bought food for the guys. After shopping, we headed back to the woods. It was around five o'clock when we reached the camp. A strange feeling came over me. Something wasn't right. The guys weren't there. We got out of the car and looked around. The campfire was still smoldering, emitting a small wisp of smoke, indicating that the guys had been here recently. Plates with half-eaten food lay nearby. All of it looked suspicious. It seemed like they had left the camp in a hurry and left everything as it was. After inspecting the camp, we headed towards the burial mound. When we got there, the guys were not there. But something had clearly happened here. Scattered on the ground were skeletons, some of them broken. I also noticed that the mummy was gone. In its place lay only a chain. I picked it up and put it in my backpack, not knowing why I did it. But it was a premonition. Bill pointed at something on the stone pedestal. I approached closer and saw bloodstains. What happened here? Could some wild animal have attacked them? I asked Bill about it, and he said it was entirely possible. Damn, we were almost done with the excavation. Why did this unpleasantness happen towards the end? And what happened to the guys? Bill, being an experienced hunter, started looking for tracks and soon found a couple of them leading in two directions. We decided that each would follow one track, but before we split up, he ran to the car and took out radios and flashlights. Setting the frequency, we agreed to immediately stay in touch. As I passed by the trees, I tried not to lose sight of the footprints and the flattened grass. At the same time, looking around, I called out loudly to my friends, but there was no answer. At one point, it seemed to me that someone was watching me. This feeling arose unexpectedly, but sharply. Goosebumps ran over my skin, the hair on my arm stood on end. Turning sharply back, I saw that there was no one behind me. Damn, maybe I'm just getting paranoid, getting scared even of my own shadow, I thought. Nevertheless, the footprints on the ground continued uninterrupted. How far could my friends have gone, and what could have frightened them so much? Continuing on my way, I suddenly noticed ahead the beginning of dense bushes. Carefully examining them, I found broken branches, clearly indicating that someone had recently passed through them. Approaching cautiously, I heard a faint rustling from behind the bushes, which made me wary. Carefully, step by step, I began to move forward, parting the branches in my path. As soon as I pushed through the last thicket, a small clearing opened before my eyes where three of them sat. It was George and the twins. With relief, I exhaled and loudly called out to them to let them know of my approach. However, upon noticing me, they recoiled in fear. Their trembling and fear-stricken eyes immediately caught my attention. I couldn't understand what had caused such a reaction. Hey guys, it's me! I tried to reassure them, but George, alarmed, shouted in response, Don't come near us, please. Stay away. Stopping, I tried to understand what had happened, what had frightened my friends so much. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that one of the twins was injured. He held one arm bent, which was wrapped in a shirt and covered in blood. What's the problem? I just came back with Bill, but you guys were gone. What happened? Can you explain to me? After my words, George hesitantly asked, Are you really Michael? Of course, who else could I be? I replied. After my words, the guys breathed a little easier, but it was clear that they still didn't fully trust me. So I asked them to tell me what happened. George began to tell. When you set off, we settled by the campfire and started preparing dinner. I took on the role of chef, and the brothers actively helped me. Only Kevin seemed detached from the common cause, constantly repeating that he was bored. 
Suddenly, he announced his intention to return to the mummy and retrieve the chain he had found there, which greatly attracted him. Then he headed to the car, armed himself with pliers, and went to the burial mound. Meanwhile, we continued to prepare dinner. After a while, when dinner was ready, we laid out the food on plates and started eating, still waiting for Kevin's return. His absence began to cause concern, and we were about to go in search of him when he unexpectedly appeared. At first glance, he seemed strange to me, but I didn't pay much attention to it, offering him food. However, Kevin, pushing it to the floor, stared at us with an incomprehensible look. Then Alex stood up and demanded explanations. In response, Kevin lunged at him and grabbed his arm so tightly that I feared the worst. Reflexively, I pushed him away, but then I noticed that his face began to change, becoming like a mist. Fear gripped me when Kevin let out an animalistic roar and assumed a threatening posture. In desperation, I grabbed a branch from the fire and hit Kevin with it, after which he lost his disguising guise, revealing to us the mummy we had found earlier. Shocked by what had happened, I attacked the mummy again with a burning branch, making it retreat. It seemed disoriented. It was our chance, and we all together fled. We ran towards the burial mound as I couldn't leave Kevin behind. But when we arrived there, he wasn't there. Seeing that the creature was pursuing us, we rushed into the forest and made it to this place where you found us. I listened carefully to his story, but my mind refused to believe it. A living mummy? What is he talking about? However, the frightened expressions on their faces made me believe their words. Deciding to set aside my doubts, I tried to contact Bill through the radio, but all I heard in response was static. Subsequent attempts to call went unanswered. So I informed my friends that it was time to go back to the cars and leave to get help. It was obvious that Bill would also head there. We walked back cautiously constantly looking around for danger. As twilight fell, visibility worsened, only heightening our unease. Suddenly, we heard a rustle ahead. We froze in fear, expecting anything. A figure approached us, and when it emerged from the bushes, we recognized Bill. He was injured, moving with difficulty, slightly hunched over and holding his hand to his bleeding side. Oh my God! I exclaimed, rushing to him. When I asked him what happened, he didn't respond. His gaze was vacant as if he were in a trance. George ran to him and put an arm around him, helping him walk. We continued our journey, but something about Bill made me uneasy, although his condition was hard to determine. I turned on the flashlight to light our way. After we had walked half a mile, George suggested taking a break and I agreed. But when he was about to release Bill, the latter unexpectedly grabbed him by the neck, squeezing hard. George screamed in panic. One of the twins decided to intervene, grabbing Bill by the head. Then something unexpected happened. A wolf's face manifested where Bill's head was. He was a werewolf. He snarled and sank his teeth into George's neck, covering him in blood. We watched in shock as the scene unfolded. But when the creature leaped at one of the twins, I yelled for them to run. But it was too late. The werewolf first caught one, then the other. I watched the scene, thinking my end was near. But then something inside me ignited, the desire to live. I ran as I had never run before. With all my strength, I ran forward, slipping past trees and jumping over roots. Fear rang in my ears. It seemed like the monster was chasing me. Faces of my friends floated in my imagination, but I could no longer help them. The realization that the creature had caught them made me move even faster. My only hope for survival was to reach the pickup and drive away as far as possible. On the way, I saw the familiar burial mound and rejoiced, knowing that the goal was not far off. Passing by, I headed towards the camp. 
Darkness had already enveloped everything around, and I decided not to stop and not to use the flashlight to avoid attracting unnecessary attention. Approaching the camp, I noticed headlights. Someone was already there. Inside me, hope flared that one of my friends had survived. Approaching the car, I noticed a cautious figure. Blinded by the headlights, I couldn't immediately make out who it was, but I heard a shout ordering me to stop. Instinctively, I realized that a gun was pointed at me and abruptly stopped, raising my hands and trying to catch my breath. The figure approached, and I recognized in it Ranger Clayton, whom I had seen earlier. He looked at me with suspicion and asked what we were doing here. I tried to catch my breath and warn him of the danger that might lurk behind. It's behind me. Be careful, I breathed out. The ranger looked behind me but found no one there. Then he approached me closer and asked if I had any weapons. I shook my head negatively, after which he ordered me to remove my backpack. I complied with his demand, throwing the backpack at his feet. The ranger opened it, checked it, and finding only a silver chain, made sure that I was unarmed. You can lower your hands, he said after which he asked how many people were still here and where they were. They're all dead, I replied. Then he ordered me to tell him what had happened. I briefly recounted the events to him, but it was evident that he didn't believe me, still keeping his weapon ready. Finally, he said to lead him to the burial mound. Approaching the designated spot, we saw scattered skeletons and a pedestal. Using his flashlight to illuminate the scene, the ranger carefully examined the evidence. It seemed that my story was beginning to find confirmation in his eyes. When he asked me to lead him to the place where George and the twins were killed, I, albeit reluctantly, obeyed his command. Clayton kept his gun up, adding seriousness to the situation. As we walked through the forest, we cautiously looked around. I thought about how I was walking this path for the second time and shuddered, turning to Clayton with a suggestion to turn back and call for help. He insisted on continuing, promising to resolve everything on the spot. Despite the expectation of an attack, the presence of an armed man nearby slightly calmed me. Eventually we reached the spot but found only blood on the ground, no bodies. I was puzzled by what was happening while the ranger began to survey the area trying to unravel the events. Suddenly a noise came from the bushes and Clayton, aiming his gun, took a defensive stance, then loudly demanded that the unknown person slowly come out. A figure emerged from the bushes and when I recognized her I was deeply shaken. It was Sarah, the same girl who had deceived me. With astonishment and shock, I stared at her, unable to believe my eyes. What are you doing here? I blurted out. But all I got in response was her sinister smile. My gaze shifted to Clayton, and I saw fear on his face. What do you see? I asked him, to which he, visibly nervous, replied. Is that a wolf or a werewolf? I was puzzled. In front of me stood my ex-girlfriend, but Clayton's words made me doubt what was happening. Sarah began to slowly approach me, while Clayton, tensely holding a gun, aimed it at her. What are you doing? I exclaimed at him. But he only continued to look at her with fear. Suddenly, Sarah made a sharp lunge forward, as if about to pounce on me. The ranger reacted quickly, opening fire. Stop! I shouted. But then my gaze fell on Sarah, who was thrown back from the shot. At that moment, a creature formed before us, Sarah's figure dissolved, and in her place appeared a huge humanoid wolf emanating malice and threat. It looked at us disdainfully, ready to attack at any moment. Oh God, what's happening here? I muttered, stepping back, overcome with fear and shock. Meanwhile, Clayton kept shooting and the creature deftly dodged. He continued firing until it vanished into the night darkness. Then, with shock in his eyes, he looked at me and said, You weren't lying. 
We need to get out of here. We began our journey back to camp, but the feeling of unease didn't leave us. The creature, like a shadow, pursued us, skillfully using the cover of darkness. It kept appearing from behind trees, making us constantly look over our shoulders, but it always slipped away before we could get a good look at it. This added extra tension, as we couldn't be sure when or from where to expect an attack. Despite the fear and uncertainty that enveloped us with each step, we kept moving, trying not to fall behind each other and staying ready for any surprises. The moon illuminated our path through the gaps in the tree canopy, adding a mystical feeling to our grim journey. Finally, after what seemed like an endless trek, we reached the camp. With relief, realizing that we were relatively safe, we exchanged looks full of concern and questions about what awaited us next. As we were about to get into the car, a werewolf unexpectedly leaped out of the bushes and lunged at the ranger with tremendous force. They both fell to the ground and the gun flew aside. Trying to help, I rushed to the weapon, but at that moment, the creature turned its attention to me. It leaped and we fell to the ground. Struggling to fend off its attack with all my might, I noticed a silver chain nearby. Grabbing it, I threw it at the beast, causing it to recoil with a whimper. Apparently, the silver had an effect on it. By that time, Clayton had managed to get up and pick up the gun, opening fire on the retreating monster. Seizing the moment, we quickly jumped into the car. Clayton started the engine, pressed the gas pedal sharply, and we left the scene, blending into the night darkness. As we drove away, constantly looking back, we tried to calm down and gather our thoughts. We had to face a nightmare of the night that would forever remain in our memory. And the fear of possible pursuit by this creature still lingered in the air.